Kallstrom's determined search for evidence of terrorism seems like a waste of time to Bernard Loeb. 80% wasn't good enough, so we trawled the bottom of the ocean. Trawled and trawled and trawled. Got up more. And the, ch and the ch net changes were what? I mean, what, hap what changed? With 60% of the plane in the ocean, for someone to crow and, and yell about the fact that they know what it is, is preposterous. And this very difficult, technical, geometric, scientific, shrinking globe of terrorism we live in. That would be the height of unprofessionalness. To Loeb, the Bureau's insistence on pursuing terrorism only made the probe more vulnerable to its critics. It prolonged this business of, it's a bomb, it's a missile. And the more the federal government said that that was a possibility, the more the conspiracists had to be right. So when the law enforcement people finally pull out and say there is no bomb and missile, the conspiracy theorists now can say it's a cover-up. April 1997, nine months after the mid-air explosion of TWA Flight 800. In a hangar in Calverton, New York, the NTSB reconstructs the shell of the aircraft from bits of wreckage scraped off the ocean floor. This was a huge, huge effort. Piece by piece, the, the pieces of the fuselage were hung off of the structure that had been built to house the uh, fuselage. With 95% of the plane recovered, Bernard Loeb, who heads the NTSB investigation, has still found no evidence of a terrorist attack. There was just no place where there was a hole that a missile could have gone through the airplane out the other side. Instead, Loeb blames the tragedy on an explosion in the fuel tank, the result of a series of preventable mechanical defects and bad luck. The problems begin when the plane is forced to wait on the tarmac at Kennedy Airport. Two air conditioning packs located directly beneath the center wing tank were running to try to cool the airplane. The NTSB theorizes that heat from the air conditioning units cooks the fuel in the nearly empty tank into a volatile mist. The tank is designed to eliminate the possibility of those vapors igniting. The only electrical components within it, the fuel probes, operate under extremely low voltage. Could these safeguards have failed? We saw when we examined other 747s that it was very, very possible that you could have had a short circuit that would have allowed sufficient energy into the fuel tank for ignition. Loeb finds an indication of such a malfunction in the crew's own words. The 12-minute flight was essentially uneventful, except for the captain mentioning, look at that crazy fuel flow indicator. Something was happening with the fuel flow indicator. High voltage from some other electrical device, lighting, avionics, even a coffee pot, could have jumped across damaged insulation into the wiring for the fuel probes, disrupting the cockpit gauges and setting off a slow motion explosion in the fuel tank. If there was a short circuit, you could have had sufficient energy in the tank to be the ignition source. And indeed, we found that that was absolutely um, plausible. According to Loeb, a tiny spark becomes the catalyst for the destruction of the 300-ton aircraft and the lives of all 230 people aboard. The flame front would propagate through the vents and all of the, the, the complex geometry and develop pressures that would be sufficient to break the tank apart. Within seconds, the main structural support, the keel beam, is fractured. TWA Flight 800 is mortally wounded. More and more of the sheet metal started to fracture, almost like an unzipping. Finally, the nose separates, and tons of fuel from the full wing tanks ignite into a fireball visible for 40 miles. But the NTSB's conclusion is based on probabilities and assumptions. Investigators never find specific evidence of either a short circuit or a spark in the fuel tank. 
While we were unable to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what happened, our conclusion was that was by far and away the most um, likely um, cause of the ignition. Following 16 months of unprecedented investigation. By November 1997, even FBI Deputy Director Jim Kallstrom agrees. Having found no evidence of a crime, he shuts down the FBI's investigation. We felt that we had enough of the evidence to reach that conclusion. And uh, we, we didn't feel comfortable about that two months earlier. I think Kallstrom was under a lot of heat. I think that there was people from the law enforcement community that were even pushing him to wind up the investigation. Has been found with At his final press conference, Kallstrom feels it necessary to account for the scores of eyewitnesses whose reports had, at first, led him to suspect a missile attack. We thought it was going to be hard to convince the people that saw what they saw that it wasn't what they actually thought they saw. Experts that we talked with about memory recall, perception, um, indicate that what people believe they saw is not an act necessarily an accurate um, representation of what they really did see. The following program was produced by the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA is called upon to produce a video that becomes the centerpiece of Kallstrom's presentation. They weren't our first choice, but they were the ones that were technically capable of doing it because we wanted to show what the vast majority of witnesses saw and what the logical explanation for what they saw was. The CIA animation is designed to demonstrate that what the eyewitnesses saw were not missiles, but the fuselage of the decapitated plane as it shot upward. It's what comes to be known as the zoom climb theory. What they determined was that people saw the actual burn up of the plane. In order for this to be possible, the plane must have climbed two or 3,000 feet before plummeting into the ocean. As soon as the nose dropped off, the center of gravity of the airplane shifted rearward. So it started to climb because the airplane had pitched up and the angle of attack now was greater. Eventually, Loeb believes, the fuselage loses momentum, dives toward the ocean, and explodes. But many who actually saw the explosion dismiss the video. That doesn't resemble anything that I saw. Uh, there were objects that traveled a great distance from outside of this plane uh, and converged on the plane. These objects didn't fly off of the plane. They came at the plane. That's not what I saw, flat out. It's not what I saw came from behind, looked like it came from behind the roof of the house on the beach. The cartoon. I can tell you that from the moment I saw the first explosion, everything was down. The CIA are the masters of deception. That's what their business is. That's what they were tasked to do. They were tasked to deceive the American public. It's not only eyewitnesses and conspiracy theorists who dispute the government's conclusion. Aviation experts like Vernon Gross provide technical critiques. He has had a decades-long career as an aeronautic engineer, including a term as a board member of the NTSB. Aerodynamically, the airplane doesn't fly without a nose. You've got tremendous air resistance coming in. The whole idea of the airplane going up is wrong. It would come down. I've stated often and well again now, this building we're sitting in has more potential to climb 3,000 feet than that aircraft did. Perhaps no investigation will be enough to quiet all the doubts about TWA Flight 800. But the events of September 11, 2001, will put those doubts into a new context. In August 2000, the NTSB closes out its investigation of the crash of TWA Flight 800. The probe had been started in a tense atmosphere of concern about what many presumed was a terrorist attack. It ends with a 425-page report filled with charts, diagrams, and the techno-jargon of a scientific treatise. In the end, the board offers only a probable cause, an accidental explosion in the fuel tank. Bernard Loeb feels that science has eliminated all other possibilities, including a terrorist missile or Navy misfire. We looked at each and every one of these theories to see if there was any possibility that comported better with the physical data 
than, than, our own, than our own theories, and simply had to conclude that all of these propositions failed in the test of, is there evidence to, to corroborate them? And there wasn't. But loose ends and unanswered questions have encouraged critics like Jack Cashel to doubt the government's conclusions. If you believe that the center fuel tank blew, you have to take their word on faith that there was some ignition source because they couldn't find it. You'd have to believe that for the first time in the 75 year history of commercial aviation that a plane just sort of self-destructed. Years after the crash, Bob Donaldson carries on his late brother's private inquiry. We got eyewitnesses saying there's missiles coming up from two or three different places. There's 40% of the front wing spar they never recovered. So if there was explosive evidence, it didn't get found. To Vernon Gross, the TWA investigation raises questions beyond science, questions of trust in our institutions. TWA represents to me mixing of politics with science and technology. And I'm saddened by that because I've always been a defender of the NTSB, being wholly objective, not swayed by any kind of force uh, from the outside. The government's own actions and inaction have raised suspicion. Only in February 2004, eight years after the disaster, did the FAA recommend filling empty fuel tanks with inert gas to make them less likely to explode. I wonder where in the world has the federal government been for eight years if, in fact, TWA went down due to a center wing tank explosion. It is an issue not lost on the people who fly the planes. Shortly after the TWA explosion, Captain Al Mundo had an in-flight discussion of this issue with a fellow pilot. He said the FAA and Boeing thought that the center fuel tank was a problem. They would have filled them with concrete last week. <laughs> and I think that's a fair assumption. But immediately after Flight 800 exploded, the FAA did spend more than a billion dollars, not on aircraft, but on improved passenger screening procedures. Today, hundreds of websites, chat rooms, and unofficial investigators propose divergent theories about the cause of the TWA 800 disaster. Some believe it was a link in a chain of events that led to another tragedy known by its numbers. 9-11. We might have avoided 9-11 if there had been a heightened sense of urgency in the airline industry. The pattern here that I'm really concerned about, and that is, would our government lie to us? Would they deceive us? Would they withhold evidence? Uh, I just think that there's more to the story that the government's not telling us, plain and simple. There are two words that explain a lot of what happened. And those two words are national security. We have a national security apparatus in which stability and trust are more important than honesty and truth. And it cuts across all parties. Has our government failed us? Or have the skeptics failed us by peddling theories based more on paranoia than facts? There was never, ever any political influence on me whatsoever to come up with any conclusion other than the truth. President Clinton himself, when numerous occasions we talked about this investigation and the attorney general and the FBI director and their direction to me always was uh, whatever you need to come to the conclusion to come to the truth of what happened to this tragedy that's what we want from you this was the most studied and examined metal that uh, anyone has ever looked at the FBI pushed to have trawling. They pushed to have diving. They pushed to reassemble the plane. Wouldn't Kallstrom or any of his people say, uh, I don't think that's a good idea to reassemble that plane. I mean, if we're covering this up, why do we want to do something like that? Don't we want to lock the hangar door and not let anybody in? Today, the reconstruction of TWA 800 is on display at the NTSB's training center in Ashburn, Virginia. It stands as either a tribute to an exhaustive, if imperfect, investigation, or as evidence of a truth that remains elusive. I said the last day of my press conference that we think we're 99.9% .9 sure of our outcome, but if we miss something and someone sees something on that mock-up, it's there. We didn't destroy it. If someone finds something that the hundreds of experts missed, bring it forward and we'll reopen the investigation.